Hello serverless people, welcome to another video on the AWS Solutions Architect Associate exam series. In this video we'll explain the VPC basic concept and as always on the second part of the video I'm gonna answer some AWS questions so we can see what are the topics that they actually ask on the exam. So let's get started with uh, VPC basic concepts. VPC stands for Virtual Private Cloud, think of it as like a logical data center in AWS. In your account, you have your default VPC, but you, you can, of course, create a custom VPC based on what you need, based on, on your use case. And actually, I encourage you to try out to build a custom VPC from scratch. VPC is composed by um, internet gateways, root tables, network access list, subnet and security groups. Remember that one subnet is always one uh, availability zone. So one subnet is associated with one and only av availability zone. So the best way to learn what internet gateways are for root tables, network accesses, subnet and security groups are of, of course like try out to build a VPC, a custom VPC and see how these components works together. So let's move on the next concept, which is the uh, security groups and network uh, access control list concepts. The security group, I think we've seen also this one on the EC2 module, but they are basically virtual firewall for EC2 instances. By default, everything is blocked, and the main features of security groups is that all the changes that you that you make on the security groups takes effect instantly. You can attach max five security groups per instance, and security groups are stateful. So if you send a request from your instance, the response traffic for the request is allowed to flow in regardless of the inbound rules of the security group. Whereas on the other hand, we have network access control list. The network access control list is an optional firewall for your VPC. So this is at VPC level. Security groups is at EC2 instances level. So you can associate a network ACL with multiple subnets, but a subnet can be associated only with one network ACL. So this is very important. You can associate it with multiple subnets, but a subnet can only have one, one network ACL. It contains a number list of rules. So the order is important because the uh, rules are everywhere started from the lowest number. And in this case, the uh, network ACL is stateless, meaning that responses to allowed inbound traffic are subject to the rules of the outbound traffic. What does it mean that if you allow SSH traffic on port 22, on inbound traffic, so you want to allow SSH into an instance, you also have to specify the outbound traffic. So you also have to allow the SSH out from that instance to your browser, so for, from the internet, your local IP depends on the use case. So also remember that on the network SCS you can block specific IP addresses, whereas on the security group it's not possible. So if you see like an exam question asking you how we can block a specific IP address, network SCL is the answer. Now another two uh, concepts that are always asked on the exam are the uh, best uh, bastion host and NAT gateway. The Bastion host is generally used to SSH into an EC2 instance inside a private VPC. So you can think of it as a proxy server and it has a manual deployment. So what I mean by this is that um, if we zoom in, we have here the users, we have uh, our security, uh, we have sorry, our um, EC2 instance behind a private subnet. And if we want these users to be able to access this um, private subnet, we use this ho with this host, this EC2 instance, and it's called Bastion Host. So the users connect to the Bastion Host, and then from the Bastion Host, who can access the uh, private subnet from his, because they are on the same VPC, is go you're gonna access the Linux instances. So that's the flow. On the other hand, we have NAT Gateway, which is used for uh, enabling like instances in private subnet to connect to the internet while preventing the internet from initiating a, co a connection. <laughs> what does it mean? The usual use case is when you have a database on your private subnet and you want this, the database to be able to download, you know, updates, patches from the internet. So you want the database to be able to initiate the connection to the internet, but not the other way around. So you don't want anyone from the internet to be able to connect to your database. So in this way, NAT Gateway allows the connection from the private uh, subnet to the internet. It's redundant in the same uh, availability zone, so you don't need to patch it, and it's all handled by AWS, and he has a public IP address. All right, so remember also these two concepts they always uh, been asked in the exam. Next point are VPC endpoints. So 
VPC endpoints are basically virtual devices used when you want to connect AWS services without leaving the uh, Amazon internal network. There are two types of endpoints, interface and gateway endpoints, and they are horizontally scaled, redundant and high available. So here the use case is, let's say you have, sorry, you have a DynamoDB behind a private subnet or uh, an S3 bucket behind a private subnet, you want these services to be able to connect to other AWS services without basically the uh, public internet. You want to keep them inside the Amazon internal network. So in this case, you use VPC endpoints. And for the VPC endpoints in particular, we have interface endpoints, which basically it has a private IP address that serves, that serves as an entry point for traffic going to support the services. And this is for like general use case. So it supports a large number of AWS services. Whereas the other way around is gateway endpoint. It's similar to NAT gateway but they only support S3 and DynamoDB. So remember this because if in your exam you have a use case where there is S3 or DynamoDB or the both of them, preferred answer is always a VPC gateway endpoint. Now, what is the concept of VPC peering? Basically, when you have more than one VPC and you want to be able to connect one VPC to another, you can uh, basically peer them. So VPC peering allows you to connect one VPC with another via direct network route using private IP addresses. This doesn't mean that uh, it is uh, transitive because trans transitive peering is not supported. You can peer uh, VPC between different regions or between even different uh, AWS accounts. The important thing is that it doesn't have to be uh, overlap CIDR addressed. So it cannot, the CIDR address or the two VPC that are uh, peer together, they cannot be overlapping. So the use case is really when you want to give access to from one VPC to another, it can be your AWS account or any other AWS account or other regions to, to another VPC, you can do this uh, peering. You can, you can actually try to do it on the uh, AWS console so you can get an idea on how it works. It basically, you send an invite to the VPC uh, the destination VPC has to accept and also the other way around. Let's move to some more like network concepts. So this is more for the connection between on-premises and uh, uh, resources on the cloud. So um, the first resource is the AWS private link. So private link provides connectivity bet between VPCs, AWS services and on-premises services. So the use case is when you want to peer out of customer VPCs. It requires a natural load balancer on the VPC and the ENI on the customer VPC. Then we have VPN Cloud Hub um, and the use case is when you have multiple sites each with their own VP VPN, Cloud Hub can connect them together. So it works with the hub and spoke model. But the thing you have to remember here is that when you see um, a scenario, when you have multiple sites with their own VPN, let's say you have different offices around the world, and you want to connect them using VPN, Cloud Hub can uh, connect them together in a hub and spoke model. Then you have um, Direct Connect, which is the best case when you want to connect your data center, so your on-premise data center to AWS. It's very useful for high throughput workloads and it's for it provides like stable and reliable secure connection. So if you see like use cases when you have company with their own data centers that it wants to connect to resources in the cloud and they need, they need like a stable and reliable secure connection, this is the uh, service that you need to implement, which is the AWS Direct Connect. Last one, we have uh, AWS Transit Gateway, which um, basically support transitive peering between VPCs and on-premises data center. So here it does support the transitive peering. It's not like the VPC peering and it works again and on the, uh, it works with the hub and spoke model. It works well with, in connection with direct connect and VPN connections and it also support IP multicast. This is one of the only um, AWS services that support IP multicast. Again, you don't need to know like all the features about these services, but you need to understand the use case. So it's really, you need to kind of associate the services to the use case. You don't need to know all the details about the features. All right, I want to go through now some exam tips. So get familiar, as I said, with the steps needed to create a VPC from scratch on the AWS console. So really go there, try to create a VPC, try to spin up a few EC2 instances on the private uh, subnet, uh, public subnet to see if you can connect from your laptop. 
you can also play with you know root table internet gateway security groups and all the others components also once you do that the next step is to try to create a vpc peering from the aws console so you can try from one vpc to connect to the other vpc instances and understand very well the difference between security groups and network acl and um, so vpc is a high present uh, content on the exam so you really need to understand all these concepts especially the ones for a vpc connection what does it mean to have what is a public subnet what is a private subnet what does it mean to have resources into a public private subnet which is the best option for let's say an application with like a three-tier application let's say so basically usually you have you know your web server on the public subnet so it can access it can be accessed by the internet then you have your database on the private network, on the private subnet, sorry, and all these kind of uh, scenario use cases. Of course, it's impossible to go through uh, all of that in just in a short video, but you need to, to know them. So now let's move on and see some AWS questions and answer with them. Okay, so the first question is, you have instances hosted in a private subnet in a VPC. There is a need for instances to download updates from the internet. How would you achieve this? Okay. So we have a private subnet and we have instances that need to download updates from the internet. So create a new public subnet and move the instance to the subnet. Uh, I don't like it because of course I don't want to move my instances. Create a new EC2 instance to download the updates separately and then push them to the required instance. Doesn't look all right. Use not get way to allow instances in the private subnet to uh, download updates. That is, this is the right answer. And we actually went through this uh, on the uh, cheat sheet. So this is the right answer. I'm going to highlight this one. And we actually, that's what we said while we were doing the cheat sheet uh, walkthrough. And this is the uh, right answer because you have this service called NAT Gateway, which basically gives the gives connection to your private subnet to be able to download resources from the internet, but doesn't allow the internet to access these instances. So... This is the perfect scenario for the NAT gateway. Let's move to the next one. You have your EC2 instances running in multiple in multiple availability zones in AWS region. You need to create NAT gateways for your private instances to access the internet. The NAT gateways need to be highly available. Okay, so we have to remember that NAT gateways are associated with availability, availability zones. So if we need the NAT gateways to be highly available, we need to create one NAT gateway for each availability zone. And uh, so we need to find the answer, which is this one, create a NAT gateway for each uh, availability zone. Uh, this one doesn't make sense because we have only two and then you cannot put it behind the uh, elastic load balancer. NAT gateway in another region doesn't make sense at all. Auto scaling doesn't make sense as well. So remember, uh, if you need like a high available solution with NAT gateways, you need to create NAT gateways for each uh, availability zone. Next one, you have an instance launched into a VPC subnet with network access control list configured to allow all outbound traffic and deny all inbound traffic. The security group is configured to allow SSH from any IP address. Okay, what changes are required to allow SSH access to the instance? The security group requires an outbound rule to allow outbound traffic. This is not true. The, because uh, security groups are stateful, the inbound uh, network ACL needs to be modified to allow inbound traffic. So we said that uh, network ACL allow out outbound and deny inbound. So this is the right answer because basically here what's happening is that the traffic can flow in, but it cannot flow out. So it's true that the security group is, is uh, allowing SSH from any IP address, but the Network ACL is not because it's denying all inbound traffic. So we need so we need to allow the inbound traffic from the ACL. The other answer were like no, this is not true. It needs to be one of the This is not true as well. Okay, perfect. So remember the uh, we we saw the concept about uh, security groups and network access control list. One is stateful. Security group is stateful. So you don't need to create if the traffic is able to flow in. You don't need to create also the rule to flow out. Whereas on the network SEL, you have to. And this is exactly the case. So next question. The company you're working for has the following setup. So two public subnets, one subnet and with the web server used by users over the internet and another subnet for the database server. Which action would you take to, to improve the security of the architecture? So 
Here we have two public subnets, one with the web server and one with the database. The best way for, for configure this architecture is to move the database into a private subnet for sure. So let's see the answers. Move the web server to a private subnet? No, because otherwise users cannot access it. Create a private subnet and move the database there. That's the correct one. Move both web and database servers to no, that doesn't make sense. Create a product server, that doesn't make sense. So even the uh, last answer. So the answer is, as we said, create a private subnet and move the database there. Okay, next question. Instances hosting the private subnet of your VPC needs to access an S3 bucket outside the VPC. The S3 bucket contains sensitive documents and your CTO wants the traffic does not traverse the public internet. How would you achieve this? So we have a private VPC which wants to um, access an S3 bucket. So if you remember from the explanation that I, did, that I did before on the cheat sheet, we have a service called VPC endpoint. So we're gonna, I'm gonna look uh, and answer with that one. You can create an update gateway to allow outbound traffic. This can work, but it's not the ideal solution. You can move the instance to a public subnet. This is not ideal. Add a VPC endpoint to the subnet. This is what I was looking for. So that's the answer. Create a VPN connection. No, this doesn't make sense. The answer is VPC endpoint and uh, S3 is the perfect uh, use case for that. Good. Let's move to the next one. You have deployed a new EC2 instance from the AWS console. After initial testing, you realize that your application doesn't, wo doesn't work until port 443 is added to security group. After you add the 443 rule on the security group, how much time it will take to the application to work properly? So remember that every change on security groups are applied immediately. So you don't, need ha you don't have any delay when you add rules or remove rules from a security group. So here the answer is very easy. It's like changes are applied immediately. Answer B. The other ones doesn't make sense at all. You don't need to reboot your instance anyway. Next question. The security group of your company has created a VPC from scratch with a, with a subnet and an internet gateway. Okay. There is an EC2 instance with a public IP. When you try to connect using the public internet, you notice the connection is timing out. You check the security group and they allow traffic coming from ports 80 and 443. What can be the reason? Okay, so we have to remember how a VPC is composed. So we have, you know, subnets, we have network ACL, internet gateways, root tables, security groups. So it seems like security groups is not a problem because it's allowing the uh, port 80, so HTTP and HTTPS. It can be something with network ACL or root tables, depends. So the instance needs an elastic IP to be discovered over the internet. This is not true because when you launch uh, an instance into a public subnet, it has a public IP. And actually here it's saying also on the question, it has a public IP. The EC2 probably is not running correctly, check the logs. This is, doesn't make sense, I think. Very general. The EC2 needs a private IP inside the VPC. This doesn't make sense at all because we want to access the uh, instance from the internet. Ensure the right entry is in place in the root table. I think that's that's the answer, yeah. So we need to make sure when we create a VPC that we also add on the root table the route to the internet uh, gateway. So last question. You work for a small startup which has deployed EC2 instances backed by EBS volumes. The security policy is to stop the development servers over the weekend and restart them on Monday morning. You notice that when the servers are restarted, nobody can access them using SSH. What has happened? Okay, so remember that when you restart instances, the, the public IP is going to change. The associated Elastic IP is a change and you need to change the SSH conf. So Elastic IP doesn't change even if you restart the instance, so this can be the answer. When an instance is stopped, the security groups are detached. This is not true at all. It's not possible to... It when an instance is stopped, the security groups are not detached. You have to detach them manually. The public IPv4 has changed because the instance has been restarted and the SSH conf needs to be updated. That's, that's the one, yes. So Every time the EC2 instance is restarted, the public IPv4 is going to change because AWS is going to allocate a new one for you. And this one doesn't make sense at all. All right, guys, I hope this uh, work through, through the VPC concepts and uh, exam questions was useful. As I said, VPC is a very core concept, ask on the exam, so make sure you know it. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, ask them on the comment. Thanks again for watching the video. Remember to subscribe and see you on the next one. Cheers.